We've come up to the Sloan Tower to get a bird's eye view of the tack piece, which is one of the best places to see our birds this winter. Our recent counts in January gave us 18,000 wetland birds using the reserve, 6,500 lapwing, 3,500 widgeon, 2,000 teal, and lots of golden plover, curlew, redshank, and ruff mixed in with them too. Although we've had a few wet and windy patches this winter, the water that's come down really hasn't been enough to get the tack piece into the best condition. So we've been working with our colleagues at the Environment Agency using one of their super silence pumps to help get water onto the reserve. You can now see the fields around about a third flooded and that's providing fantastic feeding and roosting opportunities for all of these thousands of birds. If you've not had a chance to get down and visit us this winter, you've got another few weeks to see the spectacle for yourself, particularly if a peregrine races through the tack piece and puts those thousands of waders up into the air in a big aerial display. All these birds will soon start heading off back towards their breeding grounds in the north and the east. And even here at Slimbridge, we're starting to see the first of our breeding birds start to return, things like avocets and oyster catchers. And it won't be too long before we start to say goodbye to our Buick swans for another season. The last few weeks of January saw a few more birds arrive and we've peaked at just over 120 birds for this year. And one of those latest to arrive was Dila, who's returned to meet her partner Croupier and they've been together for 19 years, so it's fantastic to have them back as a pair on the pond. Our commentator feeds will continue until the swans leave around about the end of February, so if you haven't been down and seen the winter spectacle here at Slimbridge yet, you've got a few more weeks to come and join us. The particular species I'm going to talk to you about today is the pygmy marble newt. Now these guys are found in Spain and areas of Portugal. Now the reason why they're called the pygmy marble newt is because there's another species very similar but just a lot bigger called the marble newt and they're found throughout Spain and France. In the past, we've never actually been able to breed these guys because we've only had the one female that you may have seen at our talks during our handling session. But last year, we acquired two males. So this year, they've laid eggs. What's unusual is she actually laid eggs at nine degrees. And most of the time, most of the temperate species lay eggs around about 15 degrees. A lot of newts lay their eggs on aquatic vegetation. What we do here at Slimbridge, to, so we don't upset the natural setups, is we'll add strips of bin bag liner during the breeding season so the newts can lay their eggs on them. That means that we can remove the eggs and the bin liner without affecting their tanks. We've noticed that there are some fertile eggs already on the bin bag strips and she's still swollen with eggs so hopefully she'll continue to lay throughout the breeding season and we'll get some success with some young coming through this year. Hello there and today you join us in the small mammal viewing gallery down here at Back From The Brink next door to the otters but we're in front of our water vole exhibit and we have a new inhabitant his name is Leonard and he's just joined our living collection here and uh, unlike his uh, distant cousins the dormouse he won't be hibernating over winter as a small mammal he's got to find the food for himself. Now here he does get spoilt with plenty of fresh fruit and veg and rabbit pellets uh, to keep him crunching away. So the wild population of water voles aren't as lucky as Leonard, they don't get the food delivered, they have to find it themselves and in the harsh conditions of winter anything will do. The roots, the shoots, underneath the turf, even underneath the snow and a special adaptation of the water vole is to actually gather uh, roots and shoots underneath the ice, underneath the water. This isn't a water vole skull, it's a replica of a beaver skull, his big cousin. Both rodents though, both the same adaptations for finding food underwater. Long incisors, covered with orange enamel, a lot sharper than our white enamel. Also quite a gap between the, the front teeth and the back teeth, so they can bring their cheeks across, their lips across, to actually seal off so they don't have to swallow any water or debris or mud. Also large molars at the back to grind down their food. It's very hard, tough substance to grind it down before they swallow it. So next time you're passing back from the rink, call in and see Leonard in the viewing gallery. Good place to look for the voles in this uh, enclosure. He's by his food. He likes to uh, fill his stomach throughout the day, but also if he's having a kip in his hollow log, look in the uh, reeds and the straw and see if you might see his tail sticking out the side of it. A common question we receive at this time of year is how do birds keep warm during freezing conditions? 
It's actually a fantastic question because birds have evolved a counter-current heat exchange system, a bit like heat recycling, and we're going to tell you all about that now. Sometimes we might even see birds roosting directly on the ice itself, and this is made possible as warm body temperature blood flows into the foot from the artery. This blood cools as it is exposed to the colder environment around the bird. At the same time, cooler blood is warmed up on its way back into the body. This is called a counter-current system and prevents the bird from losing energy through heat loss. Northern duck species like the mallard, pintail and shoveler have excellent heat exchange systems. In addition, they'll also spend a lot of the night moving around being nocturnal feeders, helping to keep them warm and toasty all night long. The heat exchange system of goose species are a little bit more middle of the road, so instead their tactics are to hunker down in groups during really frosty weather overnight. And entertainingly, in the morning, you'll often see these little ovals in the ice where they've kept it warm all night. Some of the tropical species in the collection, such as the magpie geese and screamers, are definitely not evolved for the cold temperatures we experience here in the UK. As aviculturists, it's our job to make sure they're appropriately housed, and so we'll provide straw and nice warm shelters for them whenever the temperatures drop, 